Happy Sabbath. To the audio, I've got a little mic. Yeah, this one here. All right. Hope everybody can hear me. Can you hear me all right? Well, it's good to see everybody today. It's a sunshiny, bright day. I am Joshua. Thanks for having me. I met some of you folks at Camp Heritage. Today is day three of a 31-day tour all over the U.S. We're traveling uh, from here to Wichita, then Colorado, Wyoming, Montana, South Dakota, all over the place. And we're going to preach in parks on the way. So if you could lift us in prayer, we would be grateful for that. Try to give people some hope. It's good to preach at people in church, but you're preaching to the choir. Like most of the time, the people get up here and say nothing that nobody's going to disagree with out there. Like, amen, well, we're all right. We're number one. Uh, how about we actually go out and talk to people? So that's what we're going to do by God's grace. And I'm going to speak in parables today because Jesus spoke in parables. I had three sermons about consecration. It's like a dirty little word. Consecration is giving yourself to God, letting God work through you. And the three sermons were about words, thoughts, and actions. But we busted it up and we had Sabbath school. Now we have two sermons. We'll have one over words and thoughts. And I'll tell you, I'm like the kind of person who needs specifics. Uh, ask somebody, how do you follow God? And they say, just, you just fix your mind on God. I had a pastor tell me that one time. You just fix your mind on God. And I said, oh, yeah, that sounds good. That sounds good. I said, how do I fix my mind on God? And then the pastor got kind of silent. And I realized that he was just the type that just kind of says things that sound good. And I said, oh, boy. And then I had to get serious about seeking God myself and talking to God myself and uh, learning to hear his voice. And so that's what we're going to talk about today. By God's grace, we're going to talk about seeking God and getting serious about it. Um, if you're seeking God, you are in the right place today. But before we start, let us pray. Our gracious Heavenly Father, forgive our sins, forgive our trespasses, forgive our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lord, if there be any seekers here seeking in spirit and in truth, Lord, we pray that you will move in your spirit and your power. Teach us and teach our hearts by your spirit, Lord. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, I need a helper right away. No. Yeah, it's, I think it's on, but let me check. Oh, yeah, you're right. How about now? Perfect. All right, I need a helper. Well, I can't be you. I've already seen you. I've already... Uh, all right, would you help me? Okay, come on up here. We're going to start with something uh, that I pray will be meaningful and helpful. And I, boy, I hope I have it. Do you see a Coke bottle? Does it, there's a Coke bottle right there. All right, come on up here. I'm going to give you a challenge. Do you like challenges? Because this challenge is going to teach you something about Jesus. Well, if you don't like the challenge, someone else will have to go. I'll do it. Hold the straw, and you have to hold the straw like this. These are just regular straws. Okay, I'll give me one too. Now, the challenge is you've got to put this in this Coke bottle, and you have to lift the Coke bottle straight up in the air. But you're not allowed to use your other hand, and you have to hold it like this. So you got to lift the Coke bottle straight up in the air. Now, I had someone break this in Colorado. It shattered on the floor. That's okay. I have more. Give it a try. Now, usually people do like this. Uh, yeah. Yeah, she's not doing so good. And sometimes people do this thing. And then people cheat, and they do like that. And I'm like, well, that's cheating. You can't do that. Now, let me ask you guys a question. Turn around this way so they can see. You know why she couldn't do that? Does anyone know why she couldn't do that? Because this was too perfect. Watch this. You take that perfect thing, and then after it's broken, now it can do something that would be impossible for the perfect thing to do. If you think God can't use you because you've made mistakes, you have not met God. You have not understood God. God uses broken people to do wonderful things. God uses broken people to do things that would be impossible for perfect people to do. That is the gospel. And that's for you kids as well. As you grow up, if you make a mistake, if you think God can't use you, well, you haven't understood God. God is in the business 
of using broken people to do wonderful things. Here, how about this? Carter, will you help me? I've got this. What do you call these in Missouri? Crayons. Crayons. We, we're Southern. We say crowns. We got our crowns here. Crayons. I, some people say crayons. And it, I travel all over the country. You'd be surprised. But crowns, crowns. Hold it up for you. Hold that up and show them. He's got a crown here. All right. Carter, color on this the best you can. Let's see if he's able to do that. Oh, it's solid work. It worked. Okay, check this out. Uh-oh. It's, I broke it now here. It won't work now, will it? Yes, it will. Yeah, it will. Wow, out of the mouth of babes. Give it a try. Hey, check it out. A broken crown still colors. Did you get that? If you think God cannot use you because you have made mistakes, you have not met God yet. I'm standing here because God is in, in existence to use broken people to do wonderful things. That is the gospel. Thank you. You can keep that one. Thank you. God uses broken people to do wonderful things. I have an acorn laying up here somewhere. Did you know that every year tens of millions of trees are planted by squirrels who buried nuts and forgot where they buried them? That is a true scientific fact. If God can use forgetful squirrels to build entire force, you think he can't use you because you make mistakes? And there might be other people who are smarter than you, who are better looking than you, who you think are this or that than you, but you are the right one for the job. God wants you. In fact, he looked at this universe and said it will be better with this person in it. I want them in it. And God breathed you into the universe. He wants you and he wants to use you. And especially to the kids as you grow up, if you think that others are bigger, smarter, wiser, better looking, God can use you. He's in the business of doing that. Turn with me to 2 Corinthians 13 and 5. 2 Corinthians 13 and 5. We're going to look at a number of things today. But if we would have God to use us, well, we have to be willing to let him come into us and use us. Who wants the Holy Spirit to be here today? Who brought it with him? That's the problem right there. Where do you think the Holy Ghost lives? In this carpet? God's in the carpet. We'll worship the carpet. God's in the pews. If God's not in us, he's not anywhere. God's got to be on us. And, and let me be more specific. Sometimes I say, who here wants more of God in their life? People say, amen. And then I say, well, if, okay, you want more of God in your life? Yes. I say, well, if you don't want them in your words, thoughts, and actions, exactly where do you want them? You want God to live in a closet down the hallway on a bookshelf? You can show people all and say, look, God lives on my bookshelf and all these red books and these unread books. God wants to live in you. He wants you to be a partaker of divinity. Maybe slow down on the scriptures that say that. Look at 2 Corinthians 13 and 5. 2 Corinthians 13 and 5 is a wonderful prescription for receiving more of God. Would somebody read it real loudly? Anybody that feels bold. Go ahead. Amen. It says, examine yourself whether you be in the faith. Prove your own self. Do not don't you test your own self, how that either Christ is in you or you be lost. Now, here's an uplifting thought. I got this jar of sand here. This is a particularly interesting jar. This is five pounds of sand. You know how much that's worth? That's five cents. You can, get a, you can get a ton of sand for, I think, $20. That's a penny, penny a pound. I'm not very good at math, but I think that's right. This is five cents worth of sand. Okay. Well, that's not very much, but something interesting can happen. They take sand and they heat it up really hot, and then they make something else out of it. Glass. Did you know glass is made out of sand? Yeah. Now, that's a nickel's worth of sand, but if you take a nickel's worth of sand and infuse it with heat, you can transform it into this. This is a Wolford lamp. It's a lamp. It's got an oil lamp as a wick. Now, this is a $100 lamp right here. Out of that same nickel's worth of sand. Hey, we can go even better than that. Check this thing out right here. Does anyone know what's in this case? I used to have a cooler one until TSA broke it. This is a wafer. It's a silica wafer. Can you see it? 
it has, if you could see it up close, it has hundreds and hundreds of tiny little imprinted chips. Can you see that? He said, whoa. whoa. <laughs> These are microchips. What do they make silica wafers out of? A nickel's worth of sand. Now, the Ford Motor Company, where I'm at, builds trucks, and they have thousands and thousands and thousands of trucks that are parked that they have built, and they can't sell, and they can't drive. You know why? There's a shortage of microchips. And the Ford Company would gladly pay $500 for each microchip they need. And if this was those microchips, this little nickel's worth of sand would be worth about a million dollars. Now, a nickel's worth of sand, a hundred bucks, a million dollars. And that makes the point. It's not what you start, it's what God does with it by His Spirit that matters. You can start right where you're at and get anywhere you want to be. God will bless you and help you. It's not how you start, it's how you finish. That is the gospel. Have you ever heard that story about the guy, he's driving along a country road and he's good and lost. And he sees a farmer and he pulls over. You ever heard this one? And he says, hey, help me out. Where, where does this road go? And the farmer looks at him and real slow he goes, you can get to anywhere in the world from this road. But that makes a good point, doesn't it? The possibilities that God has for your life are big. It's not how you start, it's how you finish. That's the gospel. God's not interested in your failures. He's interested in what you're going to do now. Now, there's one particular area that we don't talk much about as Christians. Consecration. We want God kind of <clears throat> like outside of our life and next to us. But if you want supernatural results, you've got to let God in right now. Now, the devil wants all of you. If, if the devil exists, and whether you believe that or not, I would suggest there is a nefarious force of evil that wants every bit of your soul if, it, if they can have it. But if the devil can't haul, have all of you, he'll settle for your tongue. Would you agree with that? That's like, you know, Manhattan is an expensive place to buy real estate. Is that true? They have like a quarter acre lot in Manhattan sold for like $350 million or something. Your tongue is like that real estate that the devil wants. If he could get your tongue, he can do a lot of damage. And uh, there's a good reason that we should give our tongues to Jesus, that we should let him be in our words. And instead of telling you, I think I'll just show you. Connor, do you want to help? Yeah. All right. We're going to try it. Maybe Connor and uh, would you help? Is it Cohen or Canaan? I'm sorry. Canaan and Cohen. I don't know if you guys are brothers, but you're around each other. Instead of telling you, I'll show you. Here, you stand here. And uh, you, you ever get mad, Connor? Does that happen very much? Some, yeah. Some, yeah. All right, here. You hold this. Oh, no. Okay. Shake it up real good first. Come over here on the side. He says, oh, no. Turn around so they can see that precious face. He's like, all right. Now, the devil wants to keep you from reaching your potential. And the way that he's going to do that is by conquering little parts of you, by taking over little real estate of you. Man, you're really excited about this. And, you know, the tongue might be small, but if he can get that, he's going to get your whole body, your whole soul. In the Olympics, they raced 100-yard dash. You ever see that stuff? Shoelaces are small. Do you agree? They're tiny. But if I tie your shoelaces together, you have no chance of winning that race. Is that true? Same thing with your tongue. If you'll let unclean spirits speak through you, even though it's small, the devil's got every bit of you. That's what James says. See any man says he's religious? If he doesn't bridle his tongue, his religion is worthless. Doesn't matter everything else he's doing. He says if the devil has this, he's got all of you. So if we would consecrate ourselves to Christ, we've got to let Christ have us. Now, sometimes we get upset. And um, the worst thing you can do when you're upset is to uh, open your mouth. Do you agree with that? Amen. Opening your mouth when you're angry is kind of like uh, launching a ship and starting a great journey in the middle of a storm. <laughs> like it's probably not going to go well. And before you know it, all right, you're mad at him because he took your ramen noodles. Yeah. And you're upset. And you go, <laughs> and you blurt something out. Hey, hey, it's okay. I'm sorry. I got a golden spoon I'll give you later. Don't aim anymore. Hey, chill out, man. All right. You know what? Here, get him back then. One time, back at him. Okay. All right. All right. Easy. 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 Okay. All right. Does anyone ever do that here? I'm talking to the big kids that are married. 
you open your mouth and make a mess and then immediately after you say something you regret it? Right? Anybody? And you can say you're a Christian? Hey, hang on. No, I got something for you here, Connor. Put that string back in the can, please. No, get it in there, please. Come on. Oh, you're doing awful. Here, how about you do it? Here, try to, try to get this string back in the can. Can you get it back in there? So that's like our words, right? Once, you, once they're out, you're not getting them back. Words are like arrows. Once you let it fly, you are not getting it back. And you know, by avoiding the anger of a moment, you can avoid the remorse of a lifetime. Is that true? Now, check this out. Hey, tell them you're really sorry. And do it sincerely, like tears in your eyes. It's like, I'm sorry, man. Tell them you're sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> now, he's, oh, he's loading up again, though. He said, I'm sorry, okay? He said, I'm sorry. But look, even after he apologized, do you accept his apology? Yeah. He accepted his apology. Notice that even after he accepted the apology, there's still a mess. Do you get that? Brothers and sisters, you can't go around shooting your mouth off and thinking everything's going to be okay just because you apologize. There's still going to be messes that you're going to have to deal with your whole life. Amen. Somebody say, God, help me. said, I'm trying to help you with your tongue. The first soul that you got to win is, is who? Your own. God says, i got to help you. You guys go get cleaned up if you would. Thank you for your help. Thank you for your help. I think they had a good time there. So the first soul that we got to win is our own. Hey, I'll tell you what. The Bible said examine yourself whether you be in the faith. We're going to do a little test. I like tests. You guys want to do a little test real quick? What is, uh, here, I'll say some things, and you tell me, and it has nothing to do with this. I just forgot to light this, so you can ignore that fire. What is, which one of these sounds like Christ? Wow, well, you're my, and you do it sometime too. Does that sound like Jesus speaking? No. All right, how about this one? You know, hey, we're running late. Maybe, um, maybe I could help you. Is there anything I could help you with so we can get there at one? Does that sound like Jesus? Yeah. How about this one? Well, we're late again. Looks like you'd know better. Does that sound like Jesus? No. What does it say in John? It says, by this all men shall know that you are my disciples. What's the word? By your love. You know, interesting thing, when you go to a doctor and you're sick, what is one of the first things the doctor does? He tells you to open your mouth and say, ah, and he listens real carefully to what's coming out, right? And I'll tell you, the same thing is true spiritually. If we listen really carefully to what's coming out of our mouth, we will know what's going on inside of us. We'll know if we're sick or if we're healthy spiritually. Every time that you open your mouth, you let other people look in your mind. Is that true? Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speak it. Now, we did a little test there, and uh, I'll tell you, in order for us to grow spiritually, it involves examining ourselves. Now, I have a tape measure up here somewhere amidst all of this stuff uh, down there. But the way you have to use the measurement is for us. Now, Protestants are particularly wretched. Forgive me for saying it, because Protestantism is built on the idea we'll become holy by pointing out the sins of others. No man will ever become holy by pointing out the sins of others. That's a hard saying, and you might not like me, but I said the thing. If we would become holy, if we would become righteous, we have to trade these. Can you see what these are? Yeah, binoculars. We have to trade those for like one of these right here. A mirror. And we have to begin to examine, what did our verse say in 2 Corinthians 13? Examine yourself. Examine your own self. Listen to the words that are coming out of your mouth. Is that Christ or is it another spirit? And I'll tell you, God is pouring His Holy Spirit out on the earth. I'm watching incredible things happen. The other day we have a brother who's a missionary and he's in Ghana. And he's out there on faith, and we're on faith. Brandy and I do not belong to an organization, nor do we get paid by anyone. We just, do, we just, just go. And my brother Willie's in Ghana. 3,000 kids came out the other day to hear him preach. 3,000. He took a video. I wept. They were hungry to hear it. But you know what I think Willie's secret is? And he would never say this, but I'm allowed to say it. He's holy. 
Like what you see is what you get. There is no fake with him. He's really following the Lord with all his heart. Like God can trust him even when nobody's looking. You know, that's what integrity is, right? It's doing what's right even when nobody's looking. Even on the inside, Willie is following after, after God. Now, if we're not careful, though, we could fall into this kind of religion. And I know a lot of people who know a lot more about the papacy than they do holy speaking. And they're always talking about the Pope and the Jesuits and the Illuminati and all of this. And it's like this. And you know what it says in Ecclesiastes? It says, wisdom is before the man that has understanding. But the eyes of a fool look to the ends of the earth. And they're so busy watching for evil far away, they don't realize that the devil's right there already broken in. You ever see, we drove through uh, East St. Louis the other day. Not the best town, I don't think. Because we went by and the church had burglar bars on it. And I, I don't know if you see bars over the windows and things. That's uh, probably an indicator they have some break-ins. But all the burglar bars in the world would do you no good if the burglar's already on the inside. Do you agree with that? All of the locks in the world would do you no good. And the same thing with the devil. We don't want him inside of us. He want, we want that out of us. Now, I got this mind card. You ever see one of these? Anyone here serve? Any veterans here? Well, if there is, thank you for your service. Thank you to the veterans. Thank you for your service. Now, I got this standard issue GI mind card here, and it's an interesting thing. You can diagram like where they placed all the evil minds, and you can diagram all this. And uh, apparently somebody's job was just to go around diagramming evil. Whatever say a thing, I'll say it slowly. I pray you chew on it for a minute and digest it. A diagram of evil is not the same thing as a ladder to heaven. A diagram of evil is not the same thing as a ladder to heaven. And we can get so carried away pointing out the Methodists, the Baptists, the Catholics, the Jesuits, whoever, and building these fancy diagrams of everything we think we know and miss the ladder of heaven ourselves because we are unconverted. Instead of pointing our fingers at others, we have got to become holy. And then this place will be so full, God's spirit will be so full, you have to build an addition. I mean, that's the truth. I see people broken out there, brothers and sisters, hungering for righteousness, hungering for love, especially the children. Hey, would you come up here for a minute? Yeah, stand right up top. All right, turn around here. Yeah. How about that? Does that look about right? That's true. Now, every child you meet is wearing an invisible sign that says, I want attention. And the real reason that the prisons and the mental hospitals and the cemeteries are full is because nobody bothered to read the sign. Every kid you meet is a divine appointment. Now, kids may only be a third of our population, but they're 100% of our future. Look at the kids of this church. Is this church going to be here in 20 years? It has to do with these kids. That's it. Nothing more, nothing less. They're a message that we're going to send to a time that we never see. What's that message going to be? Is it going to be a holy message? Is it going to be a good message? Who's heard this before? The hand that rocks the cradle is the hand that rules the world. You mothers out there, you have a serious job. Fathers too, but mothers especially. You mothers are laying the foundation for the next generation. Lay it well. Lay it well. Because these kids are going to go out. And you know, it's an interesting thing about kids. While children seldom are good at remembering what we tell them to do, they never fail to imitate our example. Is that true? No. He said, no. <laughs> All right, we'll see if it's true. Uh, here, take you, give me that sign back. We're going to get someone else to come up here. Would you help me? Oh, you right here. Would you, if you don't mind, come up here. And uh, let me see. Winston, would you help me, please? Let's talk about that for a minute because we have to be real careful or our lips and our lives will preach two different messages. All right. What's your name, brother? Mason. Mason. All right, Mason. You have to stand over here 
and turn this way. You can't peek. No peeking. Come over here, brother. Brother Winston, I want to show you something. You take this. It's just like mine. I want to teach you how to do this. I can tie a lot of knots. I don't boast, but I used to have to tie knots, so I still remember some of them. I'm okay. going to teach you a knot. We're going to learn it together. Just want you to watch me. Start like this. Just get your rope like yay big. In Indiana, we have yay. Do you have yay here in Missouri? You go to the hardware store and you say, how long? About yay big. All right. Got it. Just get it kind of even on both ends, like I guess. Okay, now. Go like this. See? Um, switch them. This one on top. Okay. And get it just completely dangling. You're doing perfect. Now, I don't want you to do anything. Just watch me. Don't do anything. Just watch me. I'm going to go like this. Don't do it yet. I'm going to go like this. I'm going to go like this. That's the move. Are you ready? We'll do it together. Go. Pretty close. Pretty close. Now take this one. Perfect. Go like this. Do, do, do. Now come here. Perfect. Go like that. Perfect. Let go. Now go. Do, 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 do. <laughs> and go in here like this. Perfect. Now you're going to let go of everything but this and this and pull. Wow. Now this is particularly, don't turn around Mason. Here, hold your hands out Winston, I'll show them. This is a handcuff hitch if ever you have to put somebody in handcuffs, you do like this. <laughs> now, that's, now the reason it's helpful is if the building's on fire, you can put this on over. I'm being serious. If somebody's unconscious, you can tie them and put their hands around your neck and drag them out. That's why it's useful. And this could be for other reasons, it could be bad too. Now Winston, I thank you, that was excellent. Let's get you out of here. Thank you. And stay right there. All right, Mason, turn around. Here's this. All right, Winston, you turn towards Mason. Now, tell him how to do that. It's not going well. The worse it goes, the better for the parable. Now, let me just pause because I have to get through the whole sermon. How, how do you guys think this is going to go when he tells them how to do it with his lips? I bet he could stand here all day and it wouldn't happen. And it's the same with our children. If we tell our children how to follow Christ with our lips, but our life is preaching a different message, you're wasting your time. I heard a young man, he was an old man. You know what an old man said? He said, my father did not tell me how to live. He lived and he let me watch. And if we would show by example, and, if our, and stop saying, because I said so. Who's any of the tall adults in here that tell their children, because I said so. If we would start saying, because I do so, instead of because I said so, our children would not only obey us, they would respect us. And they would learn by our example. Now, I think you might have got it eventually, Winston. Thank you. If you guys would sit down. But the whole point is this. Our children learn by watching us. And the thing that they watch us quite frequently with is our lips. Do you agree with that? They hear every word. They start sounding like us, like little sponges. Now, you're giving them hand-me-downs. I have them writing a book called Hand-Me-Downs. Does anyone in Missouri have hand-me-downs? Where I'm from, we had hand-me-downs. Hand-me-downs are these clothes that, like, they're not real awesome, usually. <laughs> but they're like, well, these were your brothers and your dads, now they're yours. And you're like, great, thanks. They're not always so great, right? And uh, hand-me-downs are behaviors, attitudes, metaphysical things that are passed to us. Man, he just sounds just like his dad when he gets angry. He picked, he picked just like an apple that fell, didn't fall far from the tree. And we have to be real careful what we're passing on to kids. They're the future, brothers and sisters. And so your example goes a lot farther than you. Now, God says, particularly in the scripture, he has this word abomination. Has anyone ever heard that word abomination? I would suggest to you that is the strongest way that God can feel about something. When he says it's an abomination, he means like he could not express his disapproval more. And in Proverbs 11, the Bible says a false weight and unjust scales are an abomination in God's sight. Abomination. What is a false weights? 
I particularly have a little set of scales here. Can you see them? Has anyone ever seen scales like these before? Yes, yeah. Well, it used to be, it used to be that you would go into, say, Jerusalem to trade, right? And you'd have to trade gold or whatever you were trading, and they would weigh it, right? Because you couldn't carry, like, three tons of wheat into Jerusalem, so you'd trade it so you could have a gold coin, because a gold coin's easy to transfer. Now, you'd have the guy that would go in there, and he would say, be weighing it. And he would say, we want to know how much you've got. And he'd have his weights and his balance. And uh, there you go. See how it's even? You guys see that? And you're just a hard case. And then, and then he said, okay, we got these. And then see how they're even? You guys see that? How about these two? Those are even, right? And then you put, oh, uh, we do them this way. And then we put them in here. And then, oh, what happened? What happened right there? Wait a minute, wait a minute. Aren't those identical? Oh, look at this. The bottom of one of them's been hollowed out and there's been some weight, like some double lot buckshot put in there in the bottom of it. And it used to be that if a guy was a scoundrel, he'd have a special set of weights, you know? And so when he was weighing everybody else's stuff, he's weighing this way. And when it was his time, he would weigh with this other weight so he could make it tilt in his favor, right? God says it's an abomination, and he's not talking necessarily about dealing with used car salesmen. I would suggest to you that how you judge others, if you judge others by a different standard than you judge yourself, God says it's an abomination. He says when you're looking down on others, he says, that's no excuse she was that way. No excuse at all. Wouldn't it? Did you get none of that? None of, you no, know, I don't want to hear about it. She's wrong, and she's just wrong. And the kids are in the back seat hearing this whole mess sucking it up like sponges. And then when it's your turn and you did the thing, you said, well, God knows my heart. He knows my foot was hurting that day. He knows I had been having a rough time at work. God knows me. See, thank God for grace. He, he knows all the reasons that I got upset and blew up on him. God says that's an abomination. He says you've got to judge others the way you want to be judged. Now, let me ask you this. Do you ever um, get upset and blurt things out and get angry? Well, here, let me have Mei Lin. Will you help me? She says no. So, well, you can come up. Come on up. All right. Mei Lin, I've got this particular Coke bottle here. You know, how, you know how foolish it is in God's sight when we are hasty? And Proverbs says, see a man that's hasty in his words, there's more hope for a fool than for him. That's a hard saying. Like you blurt things out and speak when you're angry. Uh, there's another one that says, he that can rule over his own spirit is better than he that can conquer a strong city. Have you ever heard that? There's another one that says, those who have no rule over their spirit are like a city without walls. You know what a city without walls is? Uh, they had walls around city to protect them because if some passing invaders came by, they didn't want them to come in and like overturn what was going on inside. And people without a city, uh, without walls, if you're that way... You let every passing thing upset you. Somebody bumps in you and you say, well, you're upset about it inside. Now, you know, the worst thing you can do when you're upset is talk. Open your mouth. You agree? Watch this. You know, that's just what the devil wants you to do. When you're upset, the devil wants you to open your mouth. Here, let's find out. I'm going to shake this up. Maylin, be my friend. It's okay. I'll give you a gold spoon. All right. Now, I'm going to open this on May Lynn. You want me to do it? No, say no. All right, she's like over here on the floor. Now, hey, why don't I want to open that right now? Because it's stirred up on the inside, and if I open it right now, it's going to make a huge mess on both of us. Do you agree with that? But wait, 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 wait. If we wait just like 15 seconds... It's calming down. Can you see it? In fact, if I wait about another 10 seconds, I could easily open it up without it making a mess. You know your mouth is just like that? Like, procrastination is not good, but I'm going to give you permission to procrastinate. When you're upset, you have permission to put off talking. And it's okay to say to your wife or your husband or whoever, hey, I just need like 10 minutes. You know, it's maybe it's not even you. I just need 10 minutes before I talk to you about this. Just give me 10 minutes. Look at that. Is that all the way calmed down? You want to try it? No, we're not going to try it. 
nonetheless, if you wait, you won't make a mess with your mouth. Now, there's other people who open their mouths. Uh, uh, you know anyone like this? They say, well, I'm only being honest. Yeah. So I heard an uh over there. Uh. That's how the Holy Spirit says amen. Uh. <laughs> like, uh. Does anyone know I'm only being honest? What is Ephesians 4 and 15 says this, that we're to speak the truth. There it is. In love. In love. Hey, check it out. Ah, oh, get a get a helper up here. I need somebody. Come on up, would you? All right. We're gonna say mm, here. I'll take this barbed wire here. Oh, don't worry about that. Turn around this way. Let's put this barbed wire around your wrist. It's okay. It won't hurt much. It's not real barbed wire. Put your hands out like this. Put your hand out front. There you go. All right. When people are wrong, we would want to set them free. Do you agree with that? We want to help them overcome the things they're wrong about. We want to help them. They're kind of like captives. In fact, uh, the Bible says that very thing. It says, the servant of the Lord must not strive, but be gentle unto how many men? All men have to teach patience, instructing those that oppose themselves, if perhaps God shall help them. Now, I got this big, this is the biggest pair of scissors you've ever seen. Yeah. <laughs> this is going to be good. Now, some people say, well, I'm only being honest. Right. And they go, I'm only being honest. And they kind of like that. Right. Peter is the Bible says it's a sword. Is, it, is the Bible a sword? Hebrew says that Peter and uh, was it in Gethsemane? Peter knew how to handle the sword, didn't he? He just cut his ear right off. Have you ever cut somebody's ear off using the Bible? And you quote the Bible at them and you go, well, you blah, 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 and you're using the Bible like a sword to cut somebody and cut their ear off. And they never want to hear you talk about Jesus again. I don't want to hear them anymore. I never want to hear them again. Now, on the other hand, if you put the truth with love, it becomes an entirely different instrument. If you speak the truth by itself, you say, well, I'm only being honest. And you say, that's right. Being honest is all you are being. You are not being loving. You're not being wise. You're not being gentle. You're not being good. You're not being upright. You are only being honest. And there's a lot of Christians that are only being honest. But when you're honest in loving, well, then you can set people free. He said, thank you. <laughs> then you can set people free. And there's good reason you should want that, because how we speak to people has a direct consequence upon our life. But we've got to get to know ourselves, and we have to be honest with ourselves. I have a tape recorder. If any of the kids see it, there's a tape recorder somewhere up here. And uh, yeah, here it is. This is an invention from the late 1900s. <laughs> and uh, this particular one, I'm not making this up. I got it at a junk shop for a dollar. This particular one has Billy Ray Cyrus in it. Uh, but the interesting thing, I had one of these when I was a kid and something happened and it was like a revelation. Uh, I picked it up and I hit the little red button, you know, and I talked in it. I said a whole little thing and, da, 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 and then I rewound it and I hit play. And when I played it, I said, who is that? <laughs> Whose voice is that? And I looked at the other kids in the room and I said, who is that? And they said, that's you. That's exactly how you sound. And I said, oh, goodness, I don't really sound like that, do I? And they said, that is that is exactly how you sound. Now, see, in my whole life, in my head, I thought I sounded differently. Now, there's a metaphysical lesson to that spiritually. Of all liars, memory is the most convincing and the smoothest of liars. I said, I was real gentle with her down there at the bank. I was so nice to her and this and this. But if God played the tape, a little bit of tone, a little bit of ugliness. If we could hear how we really sounded. Now, I don't say that to condemn us, but if we would uh, fulfill the Great Commission and win souls to Christ, the first soul we got to win is our own. And that means getting comfortable with like, Lord, is it me? How do I sound when I'm talking to this person? Oh, boy, that's not me and you're slinging a silly string and making Coke bottle messes. If a kid blew a Coke bottle up one time, I'd say, well, he's a kid, he doesn't know better. A 36-year-old man did it every day, I would say, I think we're looking at an idiot. <laughs> and yet I know 36-year-old men who every day go, blah, 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 make a huge mess and every day say, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. 
You're 36 years old. Christ says, do your first works. You've got to lay a sure foundation and you've got to give them your tongue. You've got to get serious about it. We had these um, poison sprayers. Anyone know what this is here? That is a poison sprayer. Don't worry, this one's empty. Uh, you could open it up and you could put uh, like seven dust in there or something. I wouldn't recommend it, but you put it in there and you put this on like this. Has anyone ever operated one of these? It looks like some uh, wily Coyote Looney Tunes thing, but you go and you go out there by the tomatoes and you do like this, right? And it sprays poison everywhere. Is that right? Now, Proverbs, I think it's 18 and 21, it says, Death and life are in the power of the tongue, and those who love it shall eat thereof. And you know your tongue is just that way. It is impossible for you to speak evil to others without breathing that poison back in yourself. You're fooling yourself. If you think you can be evil to others, impatient to others, unrighteous to others, unclean to others, and go around with your tongue doing that, understand you're dying of cancer. There is a spiritual cancer that's going to come upon you and you're not going to make it. Now, I'm not speaking evil over you. I'm telling you we've got to get serious about how we're aiming our tongues, especially if we name the name of Christ. That poison sprayer is an excellent example. Well, the consequences of that can go a lot farther than we know. I saw a guy the other day in Indiana. I was out running like five miles and he was on a hillside, these real steep hillsides. And uh, like, is it raining out here? And I look up and he has a poison sprayer and he's up there on the hillside spraying. And that, in his case, he was just taking care of some kind of pest or something. But the overspray was coming off the mountain, like all over the road and all, everyone that was walking was breathing it. And the consequences of how we speak to others can travel really far. It can go a lot farther beyond us. And all of that, well, I'm only being honest, I'm only being honest, I'm only being truthful. Well, if you're only being honest, does the devil believe in God? According to James, he does. It says the devil's believe in God, he doesn't have a problem with that. Most of the time, the devil speaks the truth. That's a little scary, right? It's how he does it. He says, this is a sinner right here, he does this, this, and this, and he's, he's an accuser, right? He casts down, he tears down, that's what the devil does. Diablo is the word in the New Testament a lot of times for the devil. Diablo means to cast in with the intention of destroying, tearing down. He's a wrecker. So he uses the truth in a way to wreck people. Now, maybe would you help me, Carter? I got some uh, Marlboro 100s here. All right, Carter, I would give you a cigarette. Does anyone have, well, hang on, man. Got one upside down in here. There we go, I'll give you that one. Now, before I light this thing, let me ask, does anyone object to, uh, Car yeah, sorry, turn around here. Does anyone object to Carter having this cigarette? Yes! Hey, praise God. Well, wait, 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 wait. Why are you objecting to it? <laughs> so naive and that's beautiful. That's beautiful. Hallelujah for that. Why are you guys objecting to that? Now, hang on, hear me out, hear me out. Oxygen's good, do you agree with that? Isn't, don't you need oxygen to live? And isn't it good for you? Isn't this room full of oxygen? Isn't it true that when he breathes through this, the air from the room is going to come through it and the oxygen is going to get in his lungs? Isn't that true? No. It is true. It's absolutely true. He's going to get oxygen through this. So what's the problem? All the other poison mixed with it. Did you get that? Truth is good, but not when you mix it with a bunch of other poison. Like impatience, hatefulness, bitterness, pride. Oh, you go on Sunday. You want them Sunday keepers. Something like that. I, my head's this big, right? I know all about Bible prophecy. I know all about all these things. Uh, people may disagree with us, but God knows us by our love. And oxygen's good, but not when you mix it with a cigarette. Let me keep this. You sit down. And the truth is good, but not when you mix it with poison. And brothers and sisters, I would suggest to you that for something to become holy and to become pure... Well, it's got to get rid of some other stuff in it. I've got a gold bar here, and it's not a real gold bar, obviously. It's a plastic door stop. Uh, if it was real, this would be worth like half a million dollars. Hey, Jesus counsels us to buy gold tried in the fire. Is that true? Does everyone know the passage? Has anyone ever bought gold cheaply? 
All right, so it's gonna take something on your part. Is that true? Buy gold, try to be in the fire. And the fire is sometimes someone that's way out of line with you at the Taco Bell. Someone that's way out of line with you at the hardware store. And you say, wow, they're being a jerk right now, big time. And I should let them have it. And God says, buy me gold, try it in the fire. What's the first Peter say? He says, if you're wrong and you're buffeted for being wrong, he says, big deal. That doesn't impress God a bit. He says, but when you do good and then somebody comes ugly against you and you take it, he said, this is acceptable to God. To become pure means to get rid of some other things. Here, I tell you what. Uh, well, maybe, would you help me again? I'm going to give him some. Come up on the top step here. Let's talk about heart purity and tongue purity. Come up here so they can see. I did give you this sucker. Would you eat this sucker? So far, we've had suckers and cigarettes. It's been a health message. <laughs> Will you eat that? It's just, eh, it's just a sucker. I can get someone else if you don't want it. You don't have to eat it. I'm asking, would you? Yeah. Okay, how about now? Would you eat this one? Uh, no. Why not? There's a bug in it. Yeah, it's a sucker with a huge bug in it. It's got a big, na well, it's got some hair in there too. But it has like a huge nasty bug inside the sucker. Well, wait a minute, it's a sucker. Don't you want the sucker? Mm, no. So what makes something pure, and let me say this slowly, chew on it, digest it. What makes something pure is not what's in it, but what's not in it. Did you get that? Pure gold isn't pure because it's gold. It's pure because it's nothing but gold. Did you get that? And when you want to become holy and Christ says, I want you to buy me gold tried in the fire, he's talking about a purity of your speech. He's talking about a lot of things, but one of them is that there'll be nothing that doesn't belong there. That everything that be right be there. Thank you, brother. A couple more thoughts and we'll close. Sometimes it isn't what we say, but it's how we say it that's the problem. I've got, uh, well, yeah, we'll do this. Hmm. I'll do this one or this one. Well, one of the kids want to help? You got, you got her hand up. Come on up. You just threw her under the bus there. She's going to come up here. All right. Do you like honey? Yeah. All right. I have some of Viroqua's. This is from Wisconsin. I get around a lot of states, 20 states the last couple years. I've got this. This isn't a trick. It's just honey. I'm going to give you this honey here. It, maybe I need to put it in warm water. I don't know how it works. All right. Now, I'm not asking you to actually do it, but would you be willing to eat that? Yeah. Here, hold it for a second. Okay. You hold that for a second. And while you're holding that, I'm going to get this glove on here and get this well all right now i'm going to take this cactus and i'm going to put this honey on the cactus yeah i see if it'll come out what are you backing up for <laughs> oh yeah that's good you like honey yeah everyone like honey you kids like honey yeah. all right have some of this honey no, thank you. you don't want it now <laughs> that was a quick no thank you <laughs> why didn't she want the honey because it wasn't what I was offering her, it was how I was offering it to her. And sometimes it's not what you're saying, it's how you are saying it. Oh, I'm drizzling honey here. Here, you take the cactus. <laughs> sometimes it's not what you say, but it's how you are saying it. Do you agree with that? If you would treat others the way you want to be treated, you have to speak to them the way you would want to be spoken to. Is that a holy concept? And it's not that you didn't tell her about our dress. It's how you told her about her dress or whatever thing. Well, we'll do one more. It's the very same one. I use it in other places, but you're so good. Do you like uh, chicken noodle soup? I'm vegan. I don't eat chickens, but we'll say it's vegan chicken noodle soup. Would you eat it? Everyone else eat it? Okay, well, too bad. Go without all right, I'm going to take that, and I've got this size six and a half bowling shoe, and it is retired. <laughs> yeah. It's, yeah. I'm not going to do it to her. It's pretty gamey. It's a nasty old bowling shoe. And I dumped the chicken noodle soup in there, and now I offer it to you. Will you eat it? Nope. So it's not what I'm offering. It's how I'm offering it. Did you get that? 
You know, a lot of times people say, I'm being persecuted for righteousness sake. People just mad at me because I got the truth. And I said, no, it's not because you're speaking the truth. It's because of how you are. It's because your lips, your lips is shutting the door to heaven to others. The way you're talking to others is completely out of line. Thank you. And so how we talk to others is important. And the Bible says the sweetness of the lips increases learning. Now, my mom used to do a thing in the kitchen. And it was strange. I'd be in the house. And we weren't, didn't have a lot of money growing up. But I would hear a certain sound. And it was like, I'm not going to do it very well, but pay attention. It was like, it's like metal on metal sound. And I would go running into the kitchen. Why do you think that is? Because she was using one of these. And uh, if everything was going right, she was not making mashed potatoes. She might be making cake, right? And then, you'd brrr, and then I would stand there and watch her until she was done. Because when she was done, she'd pull these off, right? And I would say, let me get that, let me get that. <laughs> now she'd already filled up the whole pan, and there was just like a little bit left. But I wanted that. Now, why did I want it? Let me tell you why I wanted it. Because it was bitter, it was sour tasting, and it was just foul. That's why I wanted it. Is that true? No, because it was sweet. And that's why I wanted it. And I wanted, I was drawn to it. I would come to, from the other room to get some of it. And the Bible says the sweetness of the lips increases learning. In the very same way, how we talk to others will draw them to Christ if we have a sweetness of lips. That doesn't mean you don't say hard sayings, but you can say a hard saying that's also sweet, that's also wise. Now, there's at least three or four Proverbs. In fact, there's one that says pleasant words are as a honeycomb. It says, what, uh, health to the soul or health to the bones? And you know what that is in Hebrew? Who knows the Ezekiel dry bones passage of Ezekiel? Ezekiel says, uh, speak over these bones and tell them they shall live. It's the very same language as that. It's the exact same phrase in Hebrew. It says that pleasant words will actually resurrect dead people spiritually, that it will lift them from death. And there's a lot of good reasons you should want to, but I'll close with two little thoughts. I was in uh, Gulf Spring, no, Gulf Shores, uh, yeah, wherever that's at, Gulf Shores, Alabama, two years ago with a discipleship camp. We had a small discipleship camp with young people, 20-ish. And I took them to the grocery store to get whatever they wanted. Now, they were health reformers, so you can be sure they weren't getting Pringles, but nonetheless. Uh, I told the guy, I said, you just pick whatever you want, man. That's my friend. He said, Any? I said, get whatever chips you want. He was like, yes. And he went down the aisle and he got some chips, just like this. And he turned, he said, hey, Hey, Brother Joshua, can I get these? I said, sure, man, no problem. And I was down the aisle about that far with the cart. And he goes, awesome. And he threw them in the cart. And I went like this. Oh. Why did I do that? That's right. Even the kids understand it. He said, because he broke them. I held it up and I said, brother, oh, man. I said, you just crushed those chips. And you know what he did? He picked it up and he goes, no, I didn't look, they're fine. And I said, brother, just because they look fine on the outside doesn't mean you didn't crush them on the inside. And God spoke to me right there in that aisle. And he said, be careful how you handle people, Joshua. Because just because they look fine on the outside doesn't mean you didn't crush them on the inside. And that stuck with me. Brothers and sisters, if we be the children of God, if we be the sons and daughters of God, we've got to become serious about worshiping God in spirit and in truth. And we've got to be less hasty with what we say and how we say it. I have one more parable because I just got to do it. Um, there should be some paper bags laying around somewhere. Do you kids see them? Hmm. Yeah, here they are. I'll get an adult to help me with this. Would you help me? Okay. Does anyone here have a problem being hasty, speaking hasty words? And nobody here blurts things out and embarrasses themselves? I guess it's just me. Okay. I'll go it alone. Hopefully I can show you this in a way uh, that will be meaningful, that might help you for some years to come. I have these three bags. Just Nathan, right? Thank you for the violin. It was you on the violin? 
It was wonderful. Now, I'm going to have three bags here, and I want you to pick, pick whichever one you want. Just point at it. All right. That, you, that's the one you want? Oh, boy. All right. Now, look that way. I want you to take your hand, you reach in this bag, and whatever it is, I want you to just reach in there on the count of three, and just without looking, you just pop it right in your mouth. No, I tell you what, I, I'm not going to make him do it. Hang on. Does anyone want to see him do it? Yeah! Okay, you come up here and you sit down. The Bible says to treat others the way you want to be treated. He said he wanted to see him do it, so now he's going to take it. All right, on the count of three, you're going to reach in here and you're going to pop whatever this is in your mouth. Now, hang on. Oh, it's habanero pepper seeds. Okay. Okay. Now, hang on. Let me ask you a question. While I'm getting these open, because this is going to be bad for you. You have health insurance? Okay. Now, I'm not going to do it, but let me ask you a question. If you wouldn't just reach in a bag without looking and pop it into your mouth, why would you just blurt something out? Why would you put a word in your mouth without thinking about it first? The Bible says in the book of Job, doesn't the ear taste our words like our tongue tastes our food? If you want to speak thoughtful words, you have to think first about what you're going to say. Proverbs 15 and 28 says, The heart of the righteous studies to answer, but the mouth of fools pours out foolishness. Now, I may have butchered it. Forgive me if I said it wrong, but that's the gist of it. That studying to answer means like, you know what, let me see what I'm going to put in my mouth first. In the Old Testament, Nehemiah worked for a king. What was Nehemiah's job? Does anyone know? There it is, cupbearer. What did a cupbearer do? Before the king could have his food, the cupbearer would test that food and make sure it wasn't poisonous. And then he would say, it's safe for you. Okay. God wants to know if you'll be a cupbearer for everyone. That before you speak to others, you'll taste what you're saying. Before you talk to him, let me talk about kids just for a split second. You know, kids believe things if you tell them enough times. If you tell a kid he's an idiot enough time, he'll start believing it. You call a kid stupid enough time, they will become stupid. But to be a cupbearer as a parent, as a husband, as a wife, as anything, involves tasting what you're going to offer them first. Is that poisonous? All right, I'll close with this poem. It's by Edgar Guest. It's called The Wreckers. Does anyone know that one? It says, I watched them tearing a building down, a gang of men in a busy town. With a ho heave ho and a lusty yell, they swung a beam and a sidewall fell. I asked the foreman, are these men skilled as the men you'd hire if you had to build? He gave me a laugh and said, no indeed. Just common labor is all I need. I can easily wreck in a day or two what builders have taken a year to do. And I thought to myself as I went my way, which of these two roles have I played? Am I a builder who works with care, measuring life by the rule and square, or am I a wrecker who walks the town content with the labor of tearing down? It's easy to tear down others, brothers and sisters. Any fool can do it, and most fools do. But the Bible says edify one another. It says build one another up. I said a whole lot about what we aren't supposed to do with our tongues, but I said very little about what we are supposed to do. But what we are supposed to do is encourage others. If you have a word of encouragement, speak it. If you're grateful, speak it. You know, the most common failure of Christian love is the failure to express it. Don't hold it in. Being grateful and not telling someone you're grateful is kind of like buying a present, wrapping it, and never giving it to them. When you're grateful, say it right then. Say, thank you. That violin was wonderful. I don't get that everywhere. That was really nice. All right. I suppose, I think we're out of time for this sermon anyway. All right, one more parable then. <laughs> one more parable, one more. I had some bread here, and we'll do the bread parable, which is one of my favorite all-time parables, although we skipped a bunch of parables. If, oh, she's got her hand up. Would you eat this bread? Smells like cinnamon. She well, we need someone else. Would anyone else eat this bread? Yeah. I have to come up the aisle. I'll come over there to you. Would you eat this bread? 
It's not, it's not a trick. It's like it's rubber bread, but I mean, if it was good bread. Okay, we're going to say it's good bread. If I lift this bread up and uh, carried it over to you, would, you would eat it, right? Well, let's do this. Let's try a little experiment here. I'm going to take this string, and uh, hopefully I can tie a good knot here. Now, what's your name, brother? He's like, I want to talk to you. <laughs> All right. She said she'd she, you would eat it now? Okay, come over here where they can see you. Now, if I offered you the bread, you would eat it, right? She, yeah, okay, there's nothing wrong with it. Now, what if the bread was clean and good, and I tied it to a string, and I hung it up in the air, and I carried it to you like this? Would you still eat it? Well, you don't have to eat the string. <laughs> All right, let me get someone else. Would you eat the bread if I carried it to you like this? Yeah. Uh, there's nothing wrong with the bread. You agree with that, right? It's not a trick. The trick's coming in a second. It, it's completely okay to eat the bread right now. All right, let's do it this way. How about I drop it on the floor, and I drag it over here like this, and I drag it and drag it and drag it on the ground, and then I pick it up, and I say, hey, man, I got you some bread. Would you eat the bread now? He would. He would, but you shouldn't, right? <laughs> Ruin the parable. Now, you wouldn't eat it. If, you wouldn't want bread somebody dragged on the ground, right? Matthew, and I think it's, uh, mm, forgive me, I think it's, I forget the passage of Matthew, but Jesus is asked, what's the greatest commandment? He says, love God with all your heart. Love your neighbor as yourself, ostensibly, right? And then he says, from this, from love, hangs all the law and the prophets. What's the law and the prophets? The Bible. Jesus says the Bible hangs from love. And when you read the Bible in love, interpret it in love, and offer it in love, you're like a person that's hanging the bread up and you're offering it to people. If you offer scripture to anyone at any time for any other way than hanging it from love, it's like dragging bread across the ground, offering it to someone and say, well, they didn't want to come to church. I couldn't believe it. Jesus says that everything hangs from love. Now, there's a whole bunch of parables, and we'll have a fellowship meal, and then we have afternoon service. And, uh, but for, for now, uh, I would close with this request. If we're going to fight, let's fight for each other. Let's intercede for each other. Let's change the world. What are we waiting on? Let's change ourselves and have Christ move into us, and then let that spread. Let us pray. Our gracious Heavenly Father, thank you for this fellowship. Thank you for the healthy children that are here. Lord, we pray a special covering over the children. We pray, Lord, that you would shepherd over them, that they can find love, joy, peace, goodness in their life. Bless us as we have fellowship meal. Be with our visitors. Lord, I know that you've drawn people here today. Help them to find the truth that they're seeking for, Lord. Be with us and bless us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, one request to the kids.